yesterday's class most of the people definitely have uh, understood the Gita Mahatmyam part fairly well just before that was an important point also and I just want to repeat it revise it for what it's worth the point was Pramana Vishaya. What is Pramanam? When we saw that neuronal um, image, the idea is to learn to appreciate that the knowledge given in the Shastra has the status of a Praman. The more one is able to appreciate this fact, the more one starts to align or accept, try and understand it with questioning, of course. There is no blind belief. This is one of our first lessons. Trying to understand what it says till you start seeing what it says. Just as, you know, in the courtroom, eyewitness has the greatest what is that called has the greatest um, power if there is an eyewitness in your case that eyewitness holds a great power that eyewitness is actually only one eyewitness supposing in this example i'm saying compared to all the other uh, proofs if there is an eyewitness he gets the greatest uh, precedence he gets a great power that eyewitnessing why usne dekha hai that dekha hai means now nobody can question this ye praman hai when he says maine dekha hai that means ye ek praman hai Okay, credibility. Okay, right. Thanks. Yeah. So, has the greatest credibility. Correct. So, when he says he has the greatest credibility, Praman means you have to have to accept it at some point. Shastra ka gyan, Shastra Praman hai, means what it is saying is right irrespective whether I understand it or not now I may understand it tomorrow I believe in it or not my choice I follow it or not my choice but what it is saying has a validity and that validity is independent of people class culture state time gender 
as long as there is a human being so long the knowledge inherent in the vedas and from vedas everything that gets the category of a shastram will have validity so that was a mukhya vishay yesterday's class then following the protocol as if gita mahatmyam is to be done before or after only because like yesterday also we were saying and uh, the question here also has been why are why is gita mahatmyam inclusive of it's not a part of the gita so why are we taking it up one of the biggest reasons why we are taking it up is why shas why the parampara tells us to take it up is because the mahatmyam helps us in tuning the attitude towards a praman many manti supposing i say i don't believe in all this now when i say i don't believe in all this i have a choice no doubt about it but to remove that eliminate to eliminate that possibility of self inflicted unnecessary functioning of our own independent mind whims and fancies of our mind we all have our own egoistic whims and fancies that we hold within ourselves wo chalta hai kahin na kahin ha ye point mujhe acha laga ye theek nahi laga you know ye so there is this man mein raag dvesh that expresses through the subject so mahatmyam tells us that there is a certainty of the pursuit relating it to its fruits and by giving that variation you know of itna kar lo itna kar lo the chances that they are only telling us include it in your life keep at it even if you it is very little even if you can do very very little include it in your life do not wait for ideal circumstances to come across in your life before you start your spiritual gati in fact the fact is you can only start your inclusiveness of the shastra in your life the path it shows that clarity it gives you with which when you start employing that clarity in your life your situation automatically changes but if you were to wait for ideal situation to happen like most of the people would say on retirement i'll come i'll learn this you know after all ye to boodhe logon ka vishay hai people would say fortunately i think a lot of this is gone from society now but when we started teaching it was a big obstacle because young children were not so young means it's like 20 20 you are supposed to focus on your career you are supposed to focus on your family uh, why are you getting into geeta why, why is this subject supposed to be you know engrossing you and uh, what's wrong with you the question that would invariably be asked is what's wrong with you why are you so fascinated by this subject at this point you should be orienting your life to your career and things like that fortunately i think the society is breaking that kind of a mindset now but most of the people would still say there is too much happening in my life you know there are too many obstacles in my life you know um, ah true that's right akanksha says she was asked uh, do you have depression that you are studying geeta which is now also people will ask that <laughs> it's it, it this is a something that we will have to um, face it because these are the misconceptions that there are in the society now the point of the mahatmyam is that you are uh the shastra says include it by including in it in your existing environment in your existing situation however impossible and difficult it may look like today if you include this in your life you are actually on the path of solving easing your life because you know the direction of life force there are two directions in life forces one direction is that which is towards the senses senses get pulled towards the sense objects ek direction bahar ka hai 
So there's attraction and revulsion functioning outside in the realm of senses. Likes and dislikes operate. There is this force outside that operates. The other force that helps is like we saw in the Mahatmyam, that all the ganas and all the devtas and everything, as if all the forces of nature suddenly start to come to your help when you turn against that force, against the force of the senses. And what is turning against is turning towards your own truth, towards your own self. Any effort put in the direction to know yourself, to do the right thing, to understand the right thing, to at whichever level it is, effort put there, even if you put a little, later on in the Gita says, Swalpam up Asi also. Thoda sa effort bhi agar dala hai. That effort has a fruit which will take one towards the higher. What happens to all the other fruit that you've been putting to a effort you've been putting in the sense direction? It is all going to get lost. It'll, it'll get the change will take over. The fruit will get lost. But whatever effort you put, even little effort in that direction will stay with you. And that is what will ease life ahead in time and also give you the final growth. Once you come to the point of growth, everything eases in a way. So that was the purpose of Mahatmya. If there's any other question on Mahatmya, uh, we can specific question. People have asked, uh, someone's asked, should we be chanting it um, uh, before every day Parayanam kind of, no, no. Uh, there are no rules like that. It's not like every day you have to be doing it. Uh, you can do it once, then do your chanting if you have to. Understanding, once done is good enough, but to each one their own. Shastra is only saying this is the Mahatmyam to be done. That's it. Okay. And um, how many times and how frequently they are to be done, like I've just answered. Once you do, before and after is what is said. And I am a firm believer of a verse in Gita. If even a flower is offered with devotion, with no chanting, no nothing, even that is far better than doing all hundreds of mantras and chantings. So numbers are not really important. Your capacity is what is relevant. And that should be uh, it. We move on today now to the next topic and the topic is now after Gita Mahatmyam there is Dhyana Shlokas on Gita before the Gita starts. Um, we can see the screen. Yes, Titi ji. So, um, yeah. So, Gita Dhyanam are again not a part of the Gita. It's not a part of the Mahabharata also. It is authored by some Acharya. Most commonly accepted version is an Acharya called Madhusudana Saraswati. These are nine verses. This Madhusudana Saraswati has authored these nine verses. This is common accepted. But there is a Matabheda and some say no, the author of this was Sridhara Swami who was another great Acharya, um, 15th, 16th century probably, who's also authored a lot of commentary, Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. So he has authored it. Now what was the need to author? If you remember, we just said Bhagavad Gita has now got the status of an independent Shastram. It can operate on its own to deliver the, the prayojan that it is promising and the prayojan is nishreyasa. What is shreyas for a human being? It promises that what is shreyas means what is good for you, what is beneficial for you, what is higher for you. It promises that. Therefore, nishreyas is promised by Gita and Gita being an independent text Tradition has it again. Tradition has it. Shastra is not, not. Acharyas over a period of time have realized 
that you need some sort of an invocation before starting the study. Why do we need an invocation? Like supposing we are doing these invocations, honestly speaking, Sahana Bhavatu, these are all invocations in the Upanishads. Yeah. And at the end, like we do Sarve uh, Bhavantu Sukhinaha or we do Purnamada, Purnamadam, these we have included, we have included as Acharya. So you'll find different teachers may include different invocations. The idea is first and foremost, the idea is bring the mind, collect your mind for the subject that is to be engaged now. What is the purpose of Dhyana Shloka? Dhyana Shloka means in shloko ke through to these shlokas, ye jo pure din ki pravritti man mein chalti hai, you know, throughout I am doing this and there's a thought momentum that continues for everyone and the entire force of the thought is only pertaining to the world and its activities, with starting with body and relations and kya, etc. So when you start on a topic like this, collect your thoughts away from those engagements and direct them to the study. Now, whatever you are going to engage yourself in. So, Dhyana Shloka means you dhire dhire, you know, you tune, fine tune your mind. You know, you, you're removing the focus from those thoughts and you're keeping your mind blank, free, free of all engagements, free of all preoccupations and making it available for pure Shravanam first. Hearing it. Not with a distracted and a deviated mind, partial mind, but your best focused mind is brought to the subject. So, one of the purposes of Dhyan Shlokas or invocations is we uh, tune our mind. So, by the time we are doing the invocation, we finish the invocation means now we are ready, engaging ourselves in this activity. You know, one of the uh, things like army has a uniform uh, when when you study medicine and you know the first time you wear that white coat white apron especially if you have a desire to be a doctor the first time you wear a white apron white coat sorry um, lab coat uh, as when you enter any medical college that is a very different feeling that you get suddenly your orientation of the mind has changed or i'm sure if there are lawyers and when they wear their black coats uniforms were meant for such. Invocation means the minute I am doing the invocation, my mind is now available to get into the format of learning what is going to be said, means hearing what is going to be said with a unbiased mind, open mind, questioning mind, understanding mind, but with the understanding that it is a praman. So, subject can't be wrong. Yes, your teacher can have partial knowledge. Your teacher can be wrong also, but subject cannot be wrong. Therefore, till I see it how it is, my learning has to continue. So that invocation. Second thing about the invocation, why it is needed is, and it applies to all invocations is, you are invoke. Word invoke itself is what? Invoke karna. What does the word invoke mean? You have to. Um, invoke. Sorry? To awaken. To awaken. To manifest. Uh, invoking is like manifesting. Awakening. Okay. So you invoking means you are invoking that by this prayer. It's kind of a prayer. By the prayer, you are invoking the grace that is required. Grace is anugraha. You understand that there are certain things that are never going to be in your hand. Situations cannot be in your hand. Many obstacles may come in, seeming obstacles. There will be difficulties. Not every day will you be able to attend. Not every day you can learn. Not every day your mind is the same. You know, there are certain duties that will take your mind away, time away, attention away. So by invoking, it's like a prayer to invoke the anugraha that I am starting this. May my conditions remain stable, not only stable, beneficial or conducive. I add a word with a great force. When I pray, I pray with certainty during the invoke. I'm not talking about I, means I'm conveying that point. 
that you pray with a certainty that those forces make things conducive that I am engaging in a subject which is already very subtle, will require a lot of my time and energy and effort to understand. I need that extra help from whoever those unseen hands are, keep my situation stable till the very end. That end you decide what is called the end of it. Is it the end of the subject learning? Is it the end of the chapter learning? Or is it the end of the goal that has been set by the subject? So invoking means you're invoking the grace that may there be no pratibandhakas, no obstacles during the learning of the subject. So since Gita got this independent status, Gita did not have an invocation. So the Acharyas felt it had to add an invocation. It needed an invocation. So the invocation came and has now got accepted in the Gita study itself. They are called Dhyana Shlokas. Gita Dhyanam. Reflecting on the Gita itself. Gita itself means here in the Dhyana Shlokas, it is a prayer offered as a gratitude to who are the factors that have brought Gita out in the world. The biggest Gita itself, she is considered to be the mother. And just as a mother is always looking after her child, the knowledge in the Gita acts like a mother for the seeker. So Gita itself is the first in which we uh, personify it as a mother. And then there is a prayer offered of thankfulness, of seeking Anugraha. Then of course to Vyasa, who is a writer of the Mahabharata itself. And because of him the Gita came. Krishna the most important aspect. Because Krishna spoke did all this happen. So you find in the Dhyana Shlokas nine verses. In these nine verses there are prayers offered to all of them. And they are very beautiful descriptions again. And for Krishna in particular the description is more in the sense of how, you know, metaphors, there are some metaphors over here through which you are just invoking the Anugraha. So I'll just chant this quickly. I will hope I can finish it. The chanting is a little different in tune, but you pick it up with habit and practice. Om Parthaya Pratibodhitam Bhagavata Narayane Swayam Vyasena Kratita Pura Madhye Maha Bharatam Advaitam Rita Varshinim Bhagavatim Ashtadasha Dhyayini Ambatvamanusand Thami Bhagavat Gite Bhavadveshini. So the very first verse. Om is the Mangala Charanam. Parthaya, for the sake of Partha, for the sake of Arjuna. What sake for him? Prati Bodhitam. For him to know well, for him, for his knowledge, for his clarity, to convey knowledge to him. Bhagavata, this divine mother, referring to Bhagavad Gita. Swayam Narayanena has been given by Narayan himself. Further, Vyasena Grathitam. Vyasa put it as a granth. He put those words of Narayan and brought them as a granth, as a book. Who is Vyasa? Purana Munina. He is a Muni. He is a sage. He is a, a learned. Muni means the one who knows well also. A learned very learned person 
who is also the author of Puranas, the 18 Puranas, Purana Munina. So the Grantha of Purana also he is written. Where has this Narayan given this? And uh, for the sake of Arjuna, Madhye, Mahabharatam, the Bhagavata, Bhagavad Gita, where do you find it written coming in Mahabharat? Madhye Mahabharatam, in the middle of Mahabharat. So the Mahabharat is Vyasena Granthitam, Granthitam, in the middle is this Bhagavad Gita. What is its content? Atvaita Amrita Varshini. Varsha karti hai means it's a shower of what? Amrita, nectar. It's the knowledge is like a shower. It's not sprinkles. It's not like sorry to say where we stay. Jab sab jagah bahut barish aati hai, tab hamare yahan pe itti itti barish aati hai. So it's not like a barish jo kabi kabi aati hai. The knowledge is every verse is full of knowledge. It's uh, pouring. Hmm? What kind of a knowledge? Nectarine. Nectarine means immortal. It's it's sweet. It's immortal. What is the topic? Advaita. Advaita Amrita Varshini. Hmm? Then uh, Bhagavatim Ashta Adhyayani. This Bhagavati, referring to the Bhagavad Gita, Ashta Adhyayani, 18 chapters. Amba, Thwam, calling Bhagavad Gita Amba, Mother. O oh Mother, Thwam to you, Anusandadhami. I offer my uh, surrender or I offer my prostrations. I offer my willingness to follow. Anusandadhami. I am um, I offer to follow. I meditate upon. I contemplate upon. Hmm? Bhagavad Gita. In this Bhagavad Gita, what is the nature of this Bhagavad Gita? Bhava Dveshini. Bhava means Bhava Sagar, means your samsara, the world. It is a destroyer of this samsara. Dveshini, it completely cuts it off. It destroys it. Samsara is from uh, experience of Sukha and Dukha in everyone's life. So what does Bhagavad Gita do? This Bhagavad Gita destroys the samsara. To that Bhagavad Gita, I am offering my Anusandadhami, um, which is written by Vyasa. And the words are spoken by Narayan himself for the sake of Partha. That's the first verse. Is that okay to everyone? Fairly? Yeah? You can nod. If you nod like this, I will say, I'll repeat it. Second verse. Second verse is a offering to Vyasa himself. So each verse now, Bhagavad Gita, second verse to Vyasa himself. Namostute Vyasa Vishala Buddhi Ullara Vendayata Patra Netra Yena Tvaya Bharata Taila Purnaha Rajvalito Gyana Maya Pradipaha Namo Namaha Astu I do my Namaskar. I uh, bow down. To whom? Te 
Vyasaha. To you, O Vyasa, Veda Vyas. Who are you? Vishala Buddhi. It's not that he has a huge head. He has a huge buddhi. And a huge buddhi means he has, his buddhi is got a lot of knowledge. He has a lot of knowledge. So huge buddhi, he's, he has a lot of knowledge. Not only that, further description, Pullara Vindayata Patra Netre. His eyes are supposed to be like, uh, huge also, like a f- petals of a full-blown lotus. Pullara is full-blown. Full-blown, perhaps to indicate, uh, as I said, Samstuti. I say that full-blown probably symbolizes he sees clearly. Condition ho ke dekhte hai. He sees clearly. His knowledge makes him see things clearly. So that may be symbolic of saying big eyes. Yena tvaya bharata taila punaha. By whom? Tvaya. By you. Bharata Mahabharata. You have filled Mahabharat with the oil. Completely filled it with the oil which is lit pradipaha prajvalataha pradipaha which is lit and what is it lit as jnana mayaha it is soaked in knowledge now my joke for this is or my take on this is the the food part of it when it comes you know when you have uh, prasad radha prasad or you have halwa so what do you say is halwa or kada prasad? Ghee mayam. I say it's ghee mayam. Sugar mayam. Ghee mayam means soaked in ghee. Everything on, in it is flavored with ghee. What is Mahabharat? The entire Mahabharat is soaked with knowledge. So the lamp is lit, well oiled, means it is not going to be something which has a small flame. The oil is so much in it that the light of this knowledge will remain forever. So, prajvalitaha jnanamaya pradipaha. Then, prapanna parijataya totra vetraika pāṇaye jnanamudraya krishnaya now the salutations to Krishna. Who is this Krishna? He says, Prapanna Parijataya. To the one who is surrendered. Prapanna. The one who surrenders. Krishna is a Parijata. Parijata tree is that in the mythology it is said to be the wish fulfilling tree. So whoever seeks Krishna, Krishna is the wish fulfilling tree. Also Kalpataru some people call it. So surrendered to the one who is the wish yielding tree. Totra Vetraika Panaye. This is interesting. Panaye is in hand. In his one hand, he has a stick, like a whip, which is cowherds use for the cattle. So in his one hand, he has a stick for driving the cattle. Jnana mudraya krishnaya. He also has a jnana mudra in the other hand. So on one side he has a stick whipping, on the other side he has a jnana mudra. Such a one, Gita Amrita Duhe Namaha, Namaha is I offer my salutations. He is the one who has milked Duhe, he has milked this Amritam which is Gita. He's the, he's the one who's actually extracted 
because of him the gita has come out so he is the milk of the gita to him it is namaha now that stick as a cattle that symbolism is you know you need to keep your the cattle have this behavior of running away in the fields so the cow herd the shepherd they want to keep the cattle together so the idea is your senses are your cattle and just to keep them together so krishna has this whip as if to say that the one who has surrendered to him he is kept on track i would say he is kept protected on towards his higher journey and gyana mudra everyone knows i think is this kind of a chinha uh, which symbolic of seeing uh, infinity circle infinity but uh, it's to say there is no beginning no end to your existence you are full you are whole so krishna is representing from a laukik sense he is the sh- shepherd boy he is the manager of the senses in that sense uh, and at the same time he has complete knowledge to him who has milked the gita namaha i offer my namaskar then the next verse sarvopanishado gavo dogtha gopalanandana partho vatsa sudar bhokta dogtham gita amritam maha so he says here uh, sarva upanishad gavo all the upanishads are the cows dogdha gopala nandana the milker is the gopala nandan is the son of uh, is this is the this to given as a um, actually a protector and nourisher of cows but the name for krishna dogdha gopala nandanaha parthah vatsah if a cow gives milk she gives it for her calf so who is the calf parth arjun is the calf sudhi bhokta the one who is sudhi who is pure he is the enjoyer of this so who enjoys the milk that is extracted from the cow arjuna is the calf who is drinking it because he is pure minded he is enjoying it so the one who has pure mind is the one who is receiving it enjoying it and dugtham geetam vritam mahat and for the sake of all this milk is now consumed by everyone after that so all the upanishads are the cows krishna is the one who milks them arjuna is the calf the devotees are the uh, bhokta in that sense of this great amritam geeta great nectar of geeta then vasudevasutam devam kamsa chanura mardanam devaki paramanandam krishnam vande jagat gurum so vasudevasutam the son of vasudev who himself is a dev uh, devam uh, krishna is a dev kamsa and chanura mardanam the destroyer of uh, kamsa and chanura the as- asuric tendencies you can call it the vicious people he is the joy of devaki he, as a child he gave immense joy to devaki this krishnam who is also the jagat guru he is the guru of the jagat bande i offer my 
oblations. I offer my prostrations. Then comes the sixth verse. Bhishma drona tata jayadratha jala gandharani pala shalya grahavati kripe vahani karne na vela kula ashwat Thama vikarna ghora makara Duryodhana Sini Toti Lupandava Rananadi Kaivartaka Keshava Spelling mistake uh, Bhishma Drona Tata Now um, this verse is specifically talking about how Krishna is the guide to all the samsaris. So, Bhishma and Drona are the Tata, the banks. Who is the water? Jayadratha Jala. The water is Jayadrath. Gandhara Nilotpala. The king of Gandhar is the Nila Utpala, so lily or lotus, you know, is the blue flower in this. Chalya Grahavati. Chalya, the Sarthi of Karna, is a shark, Grahavati. He is a shark here. Kripena Vahani. Kripacharya, Kripa, is the current in the river, in the waters. Karnena Bela Kula. Karna is the high waves in the water, in the river. So all these are metaphors now. Ashwatthama Vikarna Ghora Makaraha. Makara, many of you would know, is a crocodile. Whose Ashwatthama and Vikarna are the terrible Ghora crocodiles in this water. Duryodhana Vartini. This Duryodhana is the whirlpool here. Such is the river which Pandavas had to cross. And this is a very equatable subjectively also for all of us. Sotirna. Sa Utirna. Khalu. Khalu is indeed. Pandavai. Rananadi, this spelling is a mistake. Pandavai Rananadi, this battle, river battle. Rananadi, the battle, river battle. Pandavas indeed crossed Uttina, crossed over. How? How did they cross over this? Keshav, Keshava, Krishna was Kaivartakaha. He was the ferryman. So with the help of the ferryman, even a river like this, with all they have characterized, metaphorized them beautifully, that such a troubling water is also crossable in other words. This particular verse, if you take it in life, the, some people go through, everybody goes through some difficult time or the other at some point of the, their life. At that point, everything seems to be very difficult. And that difficulty is a very subjective difficulty. Nobody externally can gauge it. That kind of a samsara, and especially I think, forget about their lives, in movies and in books, one of the styles of books is, uh, when you write a book, you have to, ever since I got to know this, I've lost interest in even, I was starting to write and I've lost interest in it because you have to create first, for the protagonist, you have to create a lot of difficulties, struggles. There's a te technical term for it. And the story has to go to show how the protagonist overcomes them. But the first few things have to show that there's a lot of difficulty and struggle in, in, in a person's life. And the story is built around to show 
how they overcome these difficulties. That's the idea. So, with this difficulty that is shown, who's the? How did they overcome this difficulty? Krishna was their ferryman. So they mounted themselves on to the boat which was being ferried by Krishna. So he was able to help them navigate the river and they crossed it successfully. Then the next one is uh, seventh verse. Parasharya vachat saroja mamalam Eetartha gandhot katam Nanakhyanaka kesaram Arikatha sambodhana bodhitam Loke sajjana shatpadai raharaha Pepiyamanam muda Bhuyat Bharata Pankajam Kalimala Pradvam Sina Shreya Se. Now, this is a prayer or uh, offering a namaskar to Mahabharata itself, the text itself. And what is this text saying? Uh, Parasharya Vachaha. Parashara Vachaha. So, Parashar, the son of Parashar is Parashara. His words, so Vyasa's words, in other words, son of Parashar, his words, Saroja, Saro, Sarojam Amam, Amalam, Sarojam Amalam. Sarojam is uh, born in the lake. Amalam, pure. Gita, Gitartha Gandha Utkatam. The fragrance of the Gita. Utkatam is beautiful, has been, has come up. The fragrance has come. By the words that Parashar has put them in, so Krishna has said something and he's brought those words in the, the entire Mahabharata has, not everything Krishna has said. So Vyasa has put fragrance as if in that word, the knowledge. And further, what is Mahabharata? Nana Akhyana Kesaram. Because if there is a fragrance mentioned, it's a flower and flower has filaments. So he says, as in a flower, there are many filaments. Kesaram. Kesar is word comes from there also, the filament of a flower that Kesar is representing. That Kesaram, Nana Akhyana, there are many, many stories, small, small stories that are there in Mahabharatam. All knowledge. So, through all these various Nana, various stories that are there, it has bloomed into this beautiful flower, which is Hari Katha Sambodhana Bodhatam. So the whole um, flower has now bloomed. The Mahabharata is a fully bloomed flower whose essence is Hari Katha, who is giving the knowledge of Hari. And uh, each chapter as if has glories of Hari and Vibhutis. And therefore that knowledge that comes down to everyone as a Vibhuti Yoga in the Gita also. Loke Sajjana Shat Padai Raha Raha. So all the noble people here uh, in the world, Sajjana Shat Padaihi Raha Raha. Shat Padaihi are the bees. So the bees that are uh, the good people, they are extracting Pepiyamanam Muda. So they extract nectar from this flower of Mahabharat and Muda, they enjoy it. Puyat Bharata Pankajam Kalimala. This is May, this Bhuyat Mahabharata, which is Pankajam, which is like a lotus in a pond, which is dirty water, but as the lotus remains unaffected by the water, so to Kali Mala Pradvamsi, it is a destroyer of all the dirt. 
within and without. So may this knowledge destroy the dirt. Naha Shreya say and take us, Naha is all of us, take us to our own Shreyas, towards our own higher. So here one of the meanings is Kali has also been taken to be the ill effects of the time that have now come on Kali Yuga. So as the Kali Yuga proceeds, there's going to be more and more ill effects seen. And what are those ill effects? There will be greed and there will be all kinds of things that Puranas have already indicated as the time decays and human beings value structure keeps falling down. There will be more strife and struggle and um, all the vices will grow in proportion in society. So may Mahabharata help in destroying those vices and lead us towards our own Shreyas. So then, now the glory, it's conclusive now, the glory of um, the grace that one earns, what can the grace do? It is a kind of saying, the impossible can be achieved. If, like Arjuna said, if Krishna is on your side, means if the grace you have earned, nothing remains impossible. So it's a way of saying your own higher is also not impossible. Moksha is also not impossible. What are we talking about? Sorting life and removing difficulties from life. That seems very, very easy for one who has earned this grace. What is that grace referring? He says, Mukam karot, Mukam karoti va chalam, Pangum langhayate girim, Yat kripa tamaham vande, Paramananda Madhavam. Those who are dumb means um, mute, uh, mukam. Even they start talking. Karoti Vachalam. By his grace, even the mute can talk. Pangum Langhayate Girim. Even the lame will climb mountains. Yat Kripa Tamaham Bande. If, if your Kripa, Tam kripa, yat, aham. If I get that kripa, if your kripa is here, vande, I'm offering my salutations to whom? The one who is always in anandam, paramanandam, madhavam. To madhavam, my salutations because by your power, by your grace, the impossible gets achieved. So nothing remains impossible. So the these are only two examples, not to be taken literally. But again, the sense of exaggeration to convey that nothing remains impossible. And also, uh, in the mind of the student, everything that uh, comes in life as an anugraha, the source is returned. So supposing you have, there are some people like, you know, like children sing so well. Some children have vibhutis, they sing well. Some people uh, paint well, some are writers. Some Everybody has this unique quality in them. Something that makes them stand out, something that gives them this uniqueness of their own self, that vibhuti we say. You are identified by your vibhuti. Through these verses, one understands that whatever vibhuti I may have, that vibhuti doesn't belong to me. That vibhuti comes from mother. It comes from there. It is his vibhuti because of which every vibhuti expresses in the world. Okay. And then the last verse. Yam Brahma Varunendra Rudra Marutaha Stunvante Divyai Stavai Vedai Sangapadakramo Panishadai Gayantiyam tamaga Yana vasteta tadkatena manasa Pashyantiyam Yasyantam navedu sura suraga Aha devai asmai namaha So Devaya Tasmai Namaha. That God Namaha. Salutations. Who is this? 
it says yam brahma om brahma varuna indra rudra marutah stunvanti they all are praising all these hosts of gods who do they praise with divine hymns stavaihi divyai stavaihi divine hymns which are in the vedas vedaihi as vedas as sang sang pada krama upanishadaihi so sang in parts sang in sections the upanishads gayanti sang yam samagaha also whom the singers of samaveda uh, dhyana avasthita tat gatena with concentration on him tat gatena they go manasa pashyanti yam yoginaha means dhyana avasthita tat gatena they go to the higher gati with their focused mind manasa pashyanti yam yoginaha the yogis who see him because of their yoga sadhana in their mind pashyanti they see him. the yogis they see whom yasyantam na viduhu sura asura ganaha whose limit is not known yasya antam na viduhu not known who has no limit whose limit is not known hosts of devas and asuras by these hosts of devas and asuras nobody has been able to know him fully to such a deva tasmay namaha so offering my salutations to all these forces and to mahabharat to geeta these actually each each verse can go into a lot of details but i am trying to keep it condensed i and i have really condensed it because we have a lot of time so good for me i am not sure how much you have picked it up because i have run through everything but these are dhyana shlokas they can be taken separately at some point also the purpose is only to indicate that yes we are always in memory remembrance that knowledge of this nature cannot just come with my purusharth i can acquire a phd degree but even for a phd degree i have to have the grace of the of the of your whoever lord. manages it ha huh? of your of the lord of the lord okay but in the immediate sense of of uh, your guide without your guide <laughs> where you cannot get phd <laughs> without your guide you are not going to get your phd okay you need the grace of your guide here so you understand that even however much effort i may put if my guide is not willing to clear me then uh, i am not getting even if bhagwan has grace the grace has to fall into the guide's head so that he clears my phd you know so it has to work through the grace through so the grace has to work through the guide so the student here understands that whatever knowledge i may understand also and this is a very beautiful knowledge everybody will understand in some portion i think i have skipped that portion a bit in the geeta every verse is said to be a geeta in itself geeta is not just a book of 700 verses every shlok there is a geeta gaya gaya hai yes and the meaning is so complete that each shlok can change a person's life so it will never be that there will be nobody who benefits unless until that person represents dhritarashtra's side that is why the first prapanna pari jata hai you know the first condition is i am seeking arjuna is the starting point of Ar- bhagavad gita in our life 
unless until i am ready to seek this knowledge if i am willing and ready to seek then the knowledge every verse means everybody is going to benefit from this knowledge there is no doubt about it each one will pick up their own nectar it is not necessary that everybody will have the same nectar every person will pick up their nectar not only that with time and your inner growth the nectar will keep on uh, deepening as in you will get more nectar subtler nectar and at different stages you will keep getting different different uh, understandings nectars alag alag prasad aata hi rehta hai the knowledge just keeps you know hamara ek word hai i use the word click it just clicked you know suddenly you will be doing nothing you've just heard these and you left your mind on these words the subject for some time and in certain situations suddenly or in certain you are walking or you were just doing some normal activity and suddenly it will click the perception will click this is what it meant and that will not be final as your knowledge keeps improving and growing that perception will get finer and finer so gita by itself is something which is nectarine for human beings irrespective of any condition the only condition is you need to be a seeker of it i must have that jignasa to know kya even just general to kya likha kya kaha kya hai because it is said it is beneficial for me what is beneficial for me how can i not know isn't that common sense if shastra is said to be beneficial for me so for if it is how can i not know what is what it's saying because it's beneficial for me that means not knowing is harmful see the contrariness knowing is beneficial means not knowing will be detrimental and not knowing is what they say samsara gati so even a little of gita that's why that mahatmyam said even one third of the verse one letter has in it the capacity to change everything in sansar destroy your sansar forget change it destroys the sansar that's it and now the gita itself is um, sung as i said you know let me share the verse let's just start the first chapter also since we have the time now the first chapter now we are entering the gita as in the first chapter which is the introduction of the chapter of the gita prelude of the gita here the stage is being set so now you we have done the dhyana shlokas uh, in between anybody can practice it offered our namaskar earned the anugraha in that sense seek the anugraha and now we embark it's an auspicious day in those days the day you start the gita or you start brahma sutra they were considered to be a very momentous moment in a person's life you know it's momentous it's uh, life changing because here afterwards life can never be the same and it can never be backwards so kabhi buri to ho hi nahi sakti hai so and it is not going to remain the same so hogi kya it can only get better but for whom again i am with a lot of confidence saying it but of course uh, to each one their own uh, how you are seeking is and how the prarabdha has play each one their own but gita promises and i am confident of that so now in the first chapter itself you will find that in the gita in the mahabharat actually originally the names of the chapters are not there it is just one conversation it's like arjun ne pucha krishna ne jawab diya fir arjun ne pucha krishna it was a conversation between the two of them for the sake of the study some acharyas in between god knows when they gave the chapter headings 
18 chapters have been given names later conveying what will be in that chapter so the first chapter is actually arjuna vishada yoga and arjuna vishada yoga before we enter into it you will find that there are verses they are in a meter now how do you know the meter there is you see this letters i don't know if you can maybe i will point yeah let me point say one two full letters three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen you leave out the matras the vowel matras are not counted half half letters are not counted you saw 16 letters second line 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 in every verse most of the verses you will find there are 16 letters if you count and you break them at half of 16 is thank you my maths is zero so half of 16 is 8 so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so this is the place where you break the chant so uh, this will be the place where you break the chant 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 here you break the chant so when the letters in a line are 16 and you are breaking at 8 it's called anushtup chandaha anushtup anushtup chandaha and most of our literature actually is an anushtup meter chandas means meter it has the same tune other than anushtup commonly speaking they are saying um, there are 32 letters the longer verses which are very few in the gita that is trishtup meter but there are more chandas in the real technical sense i haven't brought it today with me just now but there are more chandas identified generally speaking anushtup and trishtup are the two chandas they say okay. so uh, here they will say how will the meter go most of you would probably know ritrashtra uh, uvacha dharma kshetre kurukshetre samaveta yuyutsavah mamaka pandavashchaiva kemakurvata sanjaya so there will be some rules of chanting of where the visarga is and uh, where the anus but at this point we will just focus on the knowledge the chanting yes i think shruti gupta has done the entire 18 chapters chanted for the sake of learning so whoever is interested can follow that channel it will be under my channel also the link is there so i think most of you already also subscribed you can practice from there for the sake of the class we will do when we are taking the verse i will chant first one of you can chant after me we won't go too much into chanting otherwise the class we are going to focus on the knowledge of the verse but just as an example we'll chant one verse and after me you know so i'll chant first and then whoever wants to practice can chant after me okay so that is the meter of the gita uh chapter is arjuna vishad yoga there is a question now there first yoga what does the yo word yoga mean because every chapter is going to end with the word yoga second will be sankhya yoga third will be karma yoga then karma sanyasa yoga dhyana yoga so every chapter excuse me ends with yoga what does yoga mean generally speaking i think everybody knows this now uniting yourself you know yuj dhatu jodna apne aap ko so purposes that through this knowledge 
whatever the knowledge is now there, this knowledge is helping you discover your own self. How does Vishad become yoga? Vishad means grief. Arjuna's grief. So the one of the there are, have to be only some explanations given. One of the explanations is because what see Krishna was Arjuna's sakha throughout. I find it very fascinating. They were friends. Arjuna and Krishna were friends. They must have had a lot of meals together, a lot of you know, ghumna ghamna baat kiya hoga, parties and baat gaye honge, restaurants, parties. They must have enjoyed themselves. With similar age groups, uh, both of them were. And they were buddies, thick buddies. Mm-hmm. Now, throughout, the conversation of Gita hasn't happened. Throughout his life, Arjuna. What made Arjuna ask Krishna's specific help made him a shishya sought his teacher in the form of Krishna, surrendered completely to him so that the knowledge could be imparted, he could receive it, was his vishad. So the trigger for his self-growth was actually Vishad and it happens in a lot of people. Most of the, like you said, people will ask, Gita mein aayin ho to depressed ho gaye ho gaye. You know, etc, etc. And it's something, lot of people, because there is that stage of life where everything seems to now to be reoriented. You have to re-understand. Whatever your orientation of life was it did not give you at some point what you thought it should give you you were not as happy so you start now asking and you take the help of scriptures to give you that answer to give you the guidance to give you the road map to give you mark darshan etc etc whatever terms so vishad is one of the very big pivotal factors and which brings a person it's like a springboard Vishad becomes redundant after that. It doesn't even matter. But for that moment, it was a springboard which helped propel Arjuna to become a Shishya, to seek the higher knowledge. So Vishada becomes the uh, triggering factor, an important factor. And therefore, they said Arjuna Vishada Yoga. Because anyway, this is not still Gyan. First chapter has no gyan in it. It is only lamenting. We are going to go through Arjuna's state of mind, you know. And a lot of times, when I do this, this is probably the fourth time in details. If I do it like this, every time after first chapter, I have no doubt Arjuna was right. Even now, I think after so much, now I know it is his mind talking, and it's all justification. But the first time I did it, I was reading it thinking I have to find the flaw. I have to find the flaw. I have to see where Arjuna was wrong. And I just couldn't. I thought he's right. How could he be wrong? He's right. He should run away from the place. He's going to kill his own people. How can, if he's feeling bad about it, if he has remorse about it, he's right. You know? And it takes you 18 chapters to see how he's wrong. And sometimes you have to do the Gita a few times before you start seeing how was his thinking incorrect. And when you start identifying that thinking in yourself, I am subject to that thinking. Arjun is not there. No longer is Bhagavad. Now that we start in the Gita, it is no longer a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna. It is me, the Arjuna, that Krishna is addressing because I have chosen to attend the Gita class. I have chosen the subject. So the subject is going to talk to me directly. So the first chapter is all going to be Arjuna, in other words, us talking. We talking. It's like me talking. When you go to 
uh, go to someone for some advice or something, the first you, know, you are talking, 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 especially if somebody is in a depressed mode or uh, vishad the grief, the counselor, especially if you go to a counselor, counselor's job is not to interrupt when you're talking. You just have to talk, you know. So Arjuna is in that state now. So that is the first chapter. And as we all know, where first chapter starts with the verse, Dharmakshetre Kurukshetre. Uh, did I just chant? Does one of you want to chant with me? First verse, we'll start. We'll do Shubharamba, Krishna Arpanamastu. Who wants to chant after me? I can do it. Uh, Priyanka? Yeah. Okay. Dhritarashtra Uvacha. Dhritarashtra Uvacha. Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre. Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre. Samaveta Yuyutsavaha. Samaveta Yuyutsavaha. Mama Kaf Pandavas Chaiva. Mama Kaf Pandavas Chaiva. Kema Kurvata Sanjaya. Sanjaya. So the whole verse together we'll do. Ritarashtra Uvacha Harmakshetre Kurukshetre Samaveta Yuyutsavaha. First, first line, then the whole verse. Ritarashtra Uvacha Harmakshetre Kurukshetre. Samaveta Yuyutsavaha Mama Kaf Pandavas Chaiva Kimakurvata Sanjaya Mama Kaf Pandavas Chaiva Kimakurvata Sanjaya Dhritarashtra Uvacha Dharma Kshetri Kurukshetri Samaveta Yuyutsavaha Mama Kaf Pandavas Chaiva Kema Kurvata Sanjaya Dhritarashtra Uvacha Dharma Kshetri Kurukshetri Samaveta Yuyutsavaha Mama Kaf Pandavas Chaiva Kema Kurvata Sanjaya um, so, here Dhritarashtra has started. Now, if you remember the story we did first two classes, the point has on the 10th day, Bhishma lays on the bed of arrows and Sanjaya has gone to say that Bhishma has fallen and Dhritarashtra goes through disbelief. It can't be, it can't be, it can't be. Goes on. He's in a denial mode. Oni Sakta, Bhishma can't fall, what will happen to my army, etc. So at that point now, at this section is where the Acharyas break it and say, okay, let us give the introduction of the Gita from here. But otherwise it's a continuity. Okay. So he says here, Dharmak Shetre, Puruk Shetre. These are the two words for Shetra. Shetra means land. Dharm Land of Dharma is the land of Kurus. Kuruo ka land is the land of Dharma. What was a place where Dharma re reigned. In his kingdom he says Dharma reigns. Samaveta yuyutsavaha collected together with desire to fight Yuyutsavaha, they are, they are eager to fight. Mamakaha. And here lies the Duryodhan, ah, sorry, Dhritarashtra Buddhi. Mamakaha, mere apne, mere pache. Mamaka, mere. And Pandavaha cha eva. And Panduputra. They have collected together. Kim Akurvat. What did they do? 
So he wants to know everything from the beginning. What did they do when they assembled the first time? Oh, Sanjaya, this first verse is supposed to be a very uh, significant verse because it starts with the word dharma. And dharma, a land where dharma was the judicial system. What is our judicial system now in the present times? Our constitution. Based on our constitution, the society runs. In that, in that time, society ran on the constitution of dharma. Society was ruled by dharma. Dharma was the yardstick to see who is right and who is wrong. Dharma has many meanings. I will do this in details in the next class, just for the introductory stage. We saw the root word for dharma, dhri. That dhri means dharan karna. Dharam, wo hai, jo dharan karta hai, means it supports you. It nourishes you, it protects you. It is, it takes you to your well-being. What is good for you by flawlessly, dharma is always good for you, good for everyone. Dharam means wo, jo karne se aapka bhala hi hota hai. It can never go against. Iska fal kabhi ulta nahi aata. Dharam is always got the fall of benefiting the jiva, the individual. Dharam kya hai? According to Vedic system, Dharam is divided in a few ways. The simple way in which the society was then divided, no longer divided, is on the basis of Varna and Ashram. The purpose of the division was not distinction, making people superior or inferior. No, that is a that is an absolutely misinterpreted, forced misinterpretation narrative that has been thrust upon the understanding. Varna and Ashrama was divided to decide individual dharmas for the sake of societal roles. According to your Varna and Ashrama, your roles were designated. Like for example, simple thing, uh, when you are not married, you are at your parents' home. You have certain duties, responsibilities. Those were called dharmas. When you marry and you have your own unit, what has happened to your dharma? Changed, expanded. Dharma is that which is divided in such a way or understood in such a way that it is the binding force which harmonizes society and the individual and flourishes it. Jahan dharam se acharan hota hai, vahan Whoever is in that environment, they are all beneficiaries. Sabka kalyan hota hai. Where dharam is the primary factor. So this dharm is where the war has become the reason for. 
धर्म क्या कहता है एंड वी आर नॉट टॉक ऑफ रिलीजन प्लीज आई नो टूडे दी सनली आर रियलाइज आई शुड क्लैरिफाई दैट टूडे द वर्ड रिलीजन हैज गॉट इम्पोज ऑन धर्म धर्म क्या कहता है मीन्स हमारा रिलीजन क्या कहता है नो रिलीजन इनफैक्ट है ही नहीं हमारे इसमें वी डोंट हैव द वर्ड रिलीजन एट ऑल इट इज धर्म पीरियड सनातन धर्म योर धर्म विच मीन्स आइडेंटिफाइंग द लॉज नेचुरल लॉज सोसाइटल लॉज हार्मनी व्यवहारिक लॉज इंडिविजुअल लॉज discovering the unity between all of these laws how you will integrate yourself there so I repeat this yes uh, discovering the natural laws means knowing what the natural laws are what are the natural laws uh, the seasons water is necessary for everyone etc natural abundance that nature has given us there are laws that they follow you you uh, you understand the laws of the nature you understand the behaviors of pranis they are also under laws you understand your own self as a part of that plan of society you also have a behavior you are also a taker of the society of natural natural habitation finding your role as what harmonizes you between the three that deciding factor was dharma so justice was always on the side of who is following dharma in fact dharma is a word dharma is the idea dharma is the concept dharma is to be followed even now dharma cannot be changed there will be relative applications and differences for different people what is your dharma may not be my dharma so what is the dharma of the soldier on the border is not the dharma of the doctor in the in the surgery the doctor doesn't have to give up the patient and start fighting the war so there will be variations individual but the principle of dharma is not going to vary its application will be individual but the principle cannot change that universal binding factor which connects the whole society and pranis to their well being is dharma and less and less dharma followed when dharma is flouted is ignored ignoring the following of dharma is called being adharmic so actual choice hai kis cheez mein follow karne mein choice nahi hai follow should be choiceless but those who take the choice the choice is i choose not to follow dharma that is called adharma is the subtle point clear this is very subtle following dharma nobody has a choice in everybody is to follow dharma because everybody desires their happiness everybody desires their well being everybody desires prosperity everybody desires peace everybody desires uh, you know togetherness everybody desires you know all our festivals like uh, sankranti and pongals where that overflowing of the food from the vessel is shown you know and when you move to a new house they would say ki doodh ko ubalo and doodh ko overflow hone do i don't know how many of you understand all these things do you anybody understands me okay uh, these are the customs but they 
heard of them. They are done. I heard of them being followed, but I didn't know the meaning till now. Now Haan. today, so the idea is there should be abundance flowing over. So let us. It's like supposing it's a home, five people, four people living together. अब अब व्यवहार should be such. अगर हम धर्म फॉलो करते हैं सब, तो this house will become a place where there will be abundance in every manner. Happiness, prosperity is nothing. There will be health. इससे ज़्यादा शरीर यात्रा में nobody is looking for more. So not only will it give you ensure everything. in coming times later on future lives also you got protected that's later concept but first concept is this much okay so we are just introducing dharma today here next class we are going to start from this very profound verse and ishwara willing ishwara's grace we are running let us always be sincere in our invocations whatever we do and aspire to finish studying the gita at least once the whole thing and as my style i think you would have most of you would have picked up the uh, i am going to address each verse as it is valid um there will be some verses which will need a lot of explanation and i will not be cutting short anything that i think is necessary even if it engages more time because it's a subtle topic and it is the most beneficial topic to a human being there is nothing higher than this that can benefit anybody so it's now that we have gathered i am not going to make compromises to my best understanding there will be certain portions of the bhashyam like the introduction of the gita itself is a very uh um, important bhashyam that shankara has written as an introduction to gita so um there will be times when you will feel uh, there may be i'm not suggesting i'm not giving you any ideas hopefully you won't have them i'm going to try and keep it as simple and enjoyable as possible but it's just to say that in my approach to it the verse will be taken to the depth as best as possible for the perception to get clear and you have all the uh, freedom to please ask questions by email of course or at the end of the class or if it's necessary to ask in between that's also perfectly fine and it should be related to the verse if you're asking in between okay so that's the format we will follow any anything any clarification in the thing so far so we are all understood clear for now so i'll just end the class it is in the in the shankar bhashyam the uh, introduction that you mentioned will we be doing that yeah okay we'll do that i'm just first uh, uh, warming up the first chapter a little bit so it should be done before the first chapter itself but i'm allowing the sanskar of the verses flow to happen and then we will do the first chapter before the actual krishna starts the topic yes. it's a lot of mimamsa there mimamsa is analysis and it's uh, but we'll try and see how much we of course it'll need all of you some of you are very new to the subject if you are very new and you struggle with it i would just say hold on you know like like that mahatmyam said even if you pick up this much it will be worth while so don't get overwhelmed if too many sanskrit words start floating in your head and there's a blankness of express we've all gone through that stage so you know suddenly you look at and say puri class mein you almost feel ki do cheeze hardly samajh mein aayi thi kabhi kabhi you know that's okay that don't worry you will understand because as soon as repetition happens in that concepts also at the end of it have the assurance you will understand so okay. om sarve sham swastir bhavatu 
ಸರ್ವೇಷಾಂತರ್ಭವಂತುಖಿನ್ರಾಣಿ ಪಶ್ಯಂತು and i'll try and stick to only one and a half hours cross back in first way but hari om everyone hari om deepti ji hari om deepti ji